Well, hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the Mori Foundation for having this wonderful meeting. And I'd like to say that Tokyo is already one of my favorite cities. I can't see how it could possibly go higher. Um, it's really great to be here, and I've enjoyed my time so far. And I think my wife is really having a great time, too. So my name is Sebastian Sung, and I'm a neuroscientist. I have recently wrote a book called Connectome to introduce a new idea and a new field of neuroscience to the world. And this book is actually being translated into Japanese. So if you haven't had enough of me, uh, uh, by the time I've, I've stopped speaking here, you can, you can go out and buy this book uh, next year uh, and read in more detail about frontiers in neuroscience. So this book is meant for the general public, but it's also been read by my colleagues. And the idea of the connectome, the idea that a map of the structure of the nervous system could be as, uh, as influential in neuroscience as the map, the, ge the genome, the map of, uh, uh, of the sequence of DNA inside a cell. Um, the idea that that could be so influential and, and possibly revolutionary in neuroscience has been very controversial. And it turns out that this controversy is really partially philosophical. It's not totally scientific. Uh, and uh, it's mirrored in other disciplines. And in fact, uh, Theo just uh, referred to it. And so I will start with this quote, this old chestnut, uh, from Lewis Sullivan, the famous American architect. And it goes like this. It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. Now, I don't know much about Lewis Sullivan's life, but I can tell that he was a man given to exaggeration. Because I might believe that it was, was, it's physical things, but uh, I'm not sure about metaphysical things. And indeed, I would say that these days, there's a lot more skepticism about the idea that form and function are intimately related. And we can speculate, speculate about why that might be. But let's take an example. Um, for example, this. This is a wonderful artifact, a drinking glass. It has a function. It allows me to drink some water, let's say. And it has a form. And we can easily perceive the relationship between the form and the function. Now, last night at dinner, I think it was Joy who asked, in the last 10 years, what is the greatest advance in design? And we all scratched our heads. And uh, Neri Oxman was the only person smart enough to actually say anything. And she said, it's, uh, it's this. It's the iPhone. And the iPhone is remarkable because of its seemingly, seemingly, seemingly completely disconnected relationship between form and function. First of all, how many functions does this object have? It's not like a glass. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of functions. And its form, a little rectangle like this, doesn't seem to have much to do with any of those functions. And so this, I think, is the reason why we are very skeptical about the intimate relationship between form and function. Um, and I would submit to you that um, this might be something that people thinking about cities should wonder about. Because architects and city planners, one of their prime ways of making the city a better place is, is the control over form in space and time. And yet, if the digital world has broken the relationship between form and function, surely that must have powerful implications for what our cities will become. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Maybe it will provoke some discussion. Now, there's another take on this, which is that the iPhone has not broken the relation between form and function. Instead, there is still a relationship, but you need a PhD in electrical engineering to understand it. A naive look at this form with our own naked eyes will not tell us what even the form is, because we can't see it. It's embedded inside the microelectronics of this phone. 
And so we could do another take on FIA, which is not that he has broken the relationship between form and function, but again, that using the properties of materials, that the relation between form and function becomes very subtle and very complex. And that is another possibility for the world of design and the world of cities, that this relationship will become much more complex. All right, so that's the general philosophizing. And I should say that um, it's the manifestations of the head. It's the mind which people are very skeptical about. Is there a relationship between form and function for the mind? You've all seen a brain. It's covered with all those wrinkles. Does that form tell us anything about the function, about how the mind works? And that's a very controversial topic in neuroscience. And my book makes the claim that indeed there is a very intimate relationship, but it's very complex. That if you look with a naked eye at a brain, there's no way to see the form that's relevant. You've got to look at a very, very small scale, at the nanoscale even, at what the structure of the brain is really like. And that we have to do that. That's the only way to ever understand how the mind works. That we're already familiar with the idea that Alzheimer's disease is accompanied by changes in the form of the brain. Holes appear in the brain at the late stages. Neurons are dying. There's clearly material destruction happening in the brain. But there's plenty of other mental disorders like schizophrenia, autism. If we look at the brain, we don't see anything wrong. And in other organs of the body, we know that's the case, that in, in the heart, if we have a heart attack, there's clearly something wrong with the form of the heart, the material destruction. The same with the liver, the same with the kidney, but still within the brain, we don't see that. We don't, there's many psychiatric disorders which are hard to believe are truly brain disorders because, because we can't see any alteration of the form. Okay, so now let me give you a historical figure, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was the first person to try to relate form and function in the brain. He lived around the same time as Lewis Sullivan. He looked into his microscope. He wanted to go beyond the naked eye and look at his, in his microscope at the forms of neurons. So you've all heard about neurons. There are these special cells inside the brain that have fantastic shapes. They have branches that go in all directions. And so he made these wonderful drawings of neurons, and he, in fact, discovered some facts about, he speculated about how neurons function just based on how they looked. Now, today, we'd like to go beyond this because it turns out, due to limitations of the light microscope, he could only see a few neurons at a time. He could only see, you could think about this as a, as a jungle or a forest of many trees, and he could see only a few trees while all the rest remained invisible. So a number of neuroscientists are working on methods for trying to see all of the neurons in the brain at the same time, to see their structures. And I'll show you a few visuals to illustrate how that's done. Here's a tiny piece of brain. It's been embedded in a hard plastic resin. And then it's put into this high-tech version of a deli slicer. It's like cutting salami, but the slices are extremely thin, maybe 30 or 40 nanometers, so a 1,000 times thinner than a hair. And those slices of brain, they float onto water that's inside that blue tub. There's the world's sharpest knife, the diamond knife, which is on the edge of that tub. And slices of brain float uh, onto the water, and they're collected by this conveyor belt. And you may see small little gray spots where the brain slices are. And then they, we take that tape, and we cut it up into strips, and we mount it on a silicon wafer. And here's Bobby Kasturi. He's a collaborator of ours at Harvard University. He tapes those strips of tape to, uh, sorry, glues those strips of tape to the wafer. And uh, we're going to see what one of those um, slices looks like. So we'll zoom in by a factor of 100,000 times on a very thin slice of brain tissue. And you'll see large white spots right now. Those are the round parts of neurons. And in between those spaces 
are the tangled up branches, except this is all in three dimensions. The structure is three dimensional. So we take images of many, many slices and we stack them up. And it's still, it's hard to see anything that looks like those neurons. What we can do is color in the cross sections of one branch of a neuron, slice after slice after slice. And if we do that over and over again, we can build up a three-dimensional reconstruction of a small part of a branch of a neuron in red. That's called a dendrite. And in green is an axon. That's a branch of another neuron. And they touch at two locations. Those are called synapses. You've probably heard about synapses. And if we zoom into the inside of the green neuron, we can see little round bubble-like objects like these. Those are called vesicles, and they contain neurotransmitter. You've probably heard about neurotransmitter like dopamine or glutamate, the chemical signals that pass inside your brain. And so when the green neuron wants to send a message to the red neuron, it releases the contents of one of those vesicles, and the red neuron senses those chemicals. So I tell my students that even when you're thinking the most refined thoughts of philosophy or religion or romance, your neurons are still just spitting on each other. I hope that translated OK. All right, so I've shown you that we can trace out the branches of neurons inside the brain. And uh, we can find the synapses, the points at which they communicate with each other. Those are the famous connections between neurons. And I should tell you that those neurons don't exist in isolation. That cube has many branches of many neurons inside of it. It's a very complex structure. And that's just six microns on, on a side, so six one thousandths of a millimeter on a side. That's the complexity like that. The total amount of wiring inside your brain is a staggering length. Total amount is about maybe millions of kilometers packed up inside your skull. So the wondrous capabilities of the mind uh, are somehow based on a very complex physical structure. Now, what could we get out of this structure? Well, that, that's what brings us to the connectome. If you can trace all the wires and find all the connections, you should be able to find a complete map of all the connections in the brain. And this has only been done for one organism. This is a worm called C. elegans. And in the 1970s and 80s, people sliced it up really thin, traced all the connections, and they made this map. So Joy, what does this remind you of? What's that? The internet. It reminds Joy of the internet because he's, uh, he believes in technology. And indeed, what else, does it, uh, this also, what else does it remind Joy of? City? City? So Joy spends most of his life on airplanes. And so I thought that he would say that it reminds him of the map you see in the back pages of airline magazines. Uh, and so imagine you take every city and you replace it by a neuron, and every flight between cities replace it by a connection between neurons. Uh, in this case, this worm's got 300 neurons and 7,000 connections, kind of like a pretty good-sized airline company. Now, your brain has um, 100 billion neurons and something like 10,000 connections per neuron. So it's much huger than this. Would never fit on the screen. Uh, wouldn't fit uh, in an encyclopedia. Uh, it's a huge amount of information. And what's in that information? Well, I'm not going to talk about it now, but maybe in the workshop later on, um, I will discuss the, the problem of trying to relate the structure of this network to its function. How can we explain the mind? And in particular, one really deep question is, is memory. How are memories about the past stored in our brains? The leading theory uh, among neuroscientists is that every time you have an experience, the connections between your neurons are somehow altered. That this diagram 
which you have, changes um, each time you have a new experience. And that's how memories are stored. It's still a theory, really, uh, but we're trying to make the uh, techniques by which we could uh, test that theory and find out if it's true. And that's why Santiago Ramon y Cajal, our, our hero from over 100 years ago, made the claim that every man can, if he so desires, become the sculptor of his own brain. I'd like to add one more thing about uh, the, the session later on, which is a, there's a game here. And to give you some understanding of why we have a game, which engages the public to help us map out neural connections, that cube you saw was, was colored in, right? All those branches were colored in. That took about 250 hours of human labor by my postdoc, Daniel Berger. And I can assure you that Daniel is much better at this than you or me. Um, and if he were to color in the wires of a piece of brain that was just one cubic millimeter in size, it would take him about 100,000 years. So we need to figure out ways of accelerating this process. We've used machine learning. So we've used artificial intelligence, tra trained a computer to emulate Daniel as well as possible. And that computer, by working with humans, can speed up the process by cutting the time required to color in those neurons by a factor of 10 or 100. But we still need people to help. And so we've created a game called iWire, eyewire.org. And we have over 80,000 registered members who play a game. They color neurons, and they have fun, and they help us discover things about the retina, which is why it's called iWire. And we've just discovered something. We've, um, uh, we think we've solved a 50-year-old mystery, which is how the retina detects moving stimuli. It's eluded neuroscientists for 50 years, and 1,678 iWires are going to be co-authors of a paper that we just submitted to Nature. So we'll talk more about that um, later this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sebastian.